Welcome to this educational program. This module discusses treatment of a condition called interstitial cystitis, or IC, also known as painful bladder syndrome, or PBS. A separate module is available that discusses the causes and diagnosis of this condition. This presentation is based on up-to-date medical literature. It is meant to be comprehensive. However, your experience or the experience of your healthcare provider may be different in one or more ways. For this reason, MD Conversation modules should be thought of as educational tools. They are not meant to provide specific advice or influence the choices you make. Please feel free to view this presentation as many times as you wish. You may also want to use the player on your left to repeat a particular slide or to skip ahead. This condition was formerly known as just interstitial cystitis, or IC, and the term painful bladder syndrome, or PBS, is now being used more commonly by doctors in this field. For the rest of this presentation, however, we will refer to it as simply interstitial cystitis, or IC. IC is a chronic condition of pelvic pain and urinary symptoms. Patients experience persistent symptoms like those of a bladder infection, but no bacteria are found in the urine. Interstitial cystitis usually, but not always, begins with a process in the bladder, then becomes a chronic pain condition in the pelvis. There are three levels of treatment for interstitial cystitis. Conservative measures, such as dietary and lifestyle changes, are always begun first. If necessary, medications are then prescribed, and these are the mainstay of long-term treatment. For a very few patients, surgical treatment may be required. Conservative therapy includes things such as lifestyle changes, timed voiding, bladder training, physiotherapy, and pelvic floor muscle training. Successful conservative treatment is centered around patient education, which is precisely why you are viewing this presentation right now. Education leads to understanding of normal bladder and pelvic floor function and can improve your ability to self-regulate those functions. Without proper education, other behavioral modifications and physical therapy will likely fall short of their potential. There are several simple lifestyle changes that one can make which can have a big impact on bladder symptoms. These include fluid and dietary modifications, smoking cessation, weight loss, bowel regulation, exercise, and stress reduction. As a general rule, fluid restriction is not advisable as a means of dealing with interstitial cystitis. Limiting fluids will make the urine more concentrated, which can worsen bladder irritation. It is best to try to cycle a larger volume of more dilute urine through the bladder. The recommendation is to take in at least 6 to 8 cups of fluid daily, mostly water, to keep well hydrated. Selective fluid restriction is appropriate in certain situations only if indicated by your doctor. Certain foods can irritate the bladder and cause flare-ups of IC symptoms for a few days after eating them. It is a good idea to watch your diet and keep track of things that seem to cause flare-ups and to try eliminating certain things one at a time until you are familiar with what foods you are sensitive to. Foods to watch out for include foods and drinks that contain caffeine, such as chocolate, coffee, tea, and colas, fermented substances, including cheeses and alcohol, aged, canned, cured, processed, and smoked meats and fish that contain nitrates or nitrites, fava beans, lima beans, onions, rhubarb, and tofu, rye and sourdough breads, most nuts except for almonds, cashews, and pine nuts, spicy foods, acidic foods and juices such as oranges, tomatoes, and cranberry juice, some artificial sweeteners such as aspartame and saccharin, and preservatives such as MSG. If you have not already heard of enough reasons to stop smoking, you may be surprised to hear that cigarette smoking has quite harmful effects on the bladder. Products of cigarette smoke may directly cause and worsen bladder symptoms of frequent and urgent urination, and they are irritating to nerve cells in the lining of the bladder. Furthermore, smoking can lead to or worsen urinary leakage or incontinence. Finally, smoking is also the single most important risk factor for bladder cancer. Bowel problems often coexist in patients with interstitial cystitis and other bladder problems. Regardless of what bladder problem you may experience, it is recommended that steps be taken to improve your bowel habits. These include increasing fluid intake, increasing fiber intake, and regulating one's bowel habits. 
your family physician or a dedicated nurse or therapist can assist you with such a program. Proper bowel habits include an adequate fluid intake, at least 30 milliliters per kilogram of body weight, a diet high in fruits, vegetables, and grains, and a regular time for bowel movement and obeying the urge to have a bowel movement. If these measures are not effective, an individual approach with medication should be developed in consultation with your physician or a nurse. Other measures which can lead to improved bladder health include a regular exercise program and regular visits to your physician. Regular exercise improves one's overall health and sense of well-being. It also promotes proper hydration, which can improve bladder symptoms. It promotes blood flow to the bladder and pelvic floor, and it improves overall muscle strength and endurance. Regular visits to your physician can help to monitor these and other important health-related issues, such as diabetes, neurological conditions, menopause, and mobility problems, all of which can affect the bladder. Certain hygienic and sexual practices for women may help to reduce bladder infections, which can lead to or aggravate IC. After urinating, wiping from front to back avoids bringing organisms from around the anus up to the opening of the urinary tract. It is common teaching that women should empty their bladder before and after intercourse, and while it is not clear how successful this is in preventing bladder infections, it remains widely recommended. Water-based lubricants may also help protect against infection. Finally, avoiding the use of diaphragms, cervical caps, spermicides, which are found in some condoms, and some vaginal douches is a wise idea. Stress, anxiety, anger, and fear can all contribute significantly to bladder symptoms. Frequent urination and sleep disturbances blamed on the bladder are seen in individuals studying for exams, changing jobs, suffering a loss, and those who simply have a so-called type A personality. In these cases, the nervous system of that individual may simply be too much in tune with their bodily functions, especially the bladder. Any technique to help relax and the removal of stressors can help to improve bladder symptoms. Pelvic floor muscle training focuses on increasing awareness and strength of the pelvic floor muscles, which support the vagina and organs in the pelvis, including the bladder, uterus, and rectum. The goals of pelvic floor muscle training are firstly to strengthen the contraction of the muscles in the pelvic floor. This is useful both to help suppress bladder urges and to prevent leakage of urine. Secondly, they can help to improve awareness and relaxation of the pelvic muscles, which can improve bladder emptying and pelvic pain. Finally, as an added benefit, the increased awareness of these muscles may lead to an increased pleasure during sexual activity. Pelvic floor exercises can be done independently at home or with the assistance of a dedicated pelvic therapist when available. These therapists can do an initial evaluation, set up a home program, and monitor results. They also have many special techniques at their disposal, such as biofeedback and TENS, which can be useful for some patients. A TENS machine delivers painless electrical impulses to nerves. Several electrodes temporarily attached to the skin carry these impulses. Researchers are not sure why TENS reduces pain, frequency, and urgency for some people with IC. It may increase blood flow to the bladder, strengthen muscles in the pelvis, or both. The goal of bladder training, or retraining, is to gain a greater control over urgency, to accept larger amounts of urine, and to reduce urge-related accidents. To be successful, this therapy requires significant motivation, and is best done with the assistance of a dedicated therapist, and occasionally with voiding diaries to provide feedback. Initially, you are asked to adopt a regular schedule of urination. For example, set a goal of only urinating every hour or two by the clock. When an urge to urinate does come on, try to suppress this using the techniques on the next slide. Gradually, you will be able to lengthen the interval between urinations. Try these techniques to suppress urinary urges. Stop what you are doing and stay still. Squeeze the pelvic floor five or six times quickly, two to three seconds each contraction. Keep the rest of the body relaxed. Focus on something else, such as counting backwards. And finally, as the urge passes, try to walk to the bathroom at a normal, relaxed pace. There are three categories of oral medications, or pills, that are commonly used for interstitial cystitis. Often, medications from all three categories are required. These categories are bladder medications, antihistamines and nervous system medications, 
and pain medications. Elmeron, or Pentasan polysulfate, is the only oral medication available that works to improve the lining of the bladder for some people. Exactly how it works is not well understood. One theory is that Elmeron helps to restore the bladder wall's protective coating to prevent substances from leaking across into the bladder wall and causing inflammation. It may also decrease inflammation directly. The usual dose of Elmeron is 100 mg taken three times daily. It is not unusual for improvement to take six months or more to become apparent. Elmeron has been shown to be generally well tolerated. Side effects are generally mild. They do not cause many people to stop the drug, and if bothersome, they do go away once the drug is stopped. The most common side effects are blood in the stool, diarrhea, nausea, hair loss, headache, rash, upset stomach, abdominal pain, liver function changes, and dizziness. Elmeron can also have a weak blood thinning effect, which may increase bleeding. Notify your doctor if you will be undergoing surgery or will begin taking other blood thinners, such as warfarin, heparin, high doses of aspirin, or anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen. Vistaril and Atarax contain hydroxazine, which is an antihistamine, normally used to reduce the itching component of an allergic reaction. In some patients with IC, especially those who also suffer from allergies, flare-ups may be related to the release of histamine in the bladder wall, causing inflammation. These patients are most likely to benefit from these drugs. Antihistamines may have multiple effects in treating interstitial cystitis. By preventing histamine release, they may prevent flare-ups of symptoms directly. They may also have a relaxant effect on the bladder muscle, and they may have a sedative effect which can improve sleep. The usual dose is about 25 to 75 milligrams per day, depending on your response and your doctor's preference. Antihistamines can worsen the sedative effect of certain other drugs. You should check with your doctor to be sure that you are not on other medications that can interact with them. Possible side effects of antihistamines include, but are not limited to, drowsiness, dizziness, confusion, dry mouth and eyes, and stomach upset. Check with your doctor, pharmacist, or the prescription insert for more detailed information about these drugs. Certain drugs that act on the central nervous system are commonly used in patients with IC. The most common are drugs within a class called tricyclic antidepressants, and especially the drug amitriptyline, or Elevil. These drugs may have multiple benefits, including reducing sensitivity to bladder filling, relaxing the bladder muscle, relieving chronic pain, improving sleep, and improving mood. Elevil is usually dosed from about 25 to 75 milligrams per day, taken at bedtime. Keep in mind that it may take four weeks or more to see benefit from these medications. Do not stop taking these medications suddenly without guidance from your doctor. Finally, beware of taking these types of drugs with certain other medications, especially a class called monoamine oxidase inhibitors. They can also add to the sedative effect of other medications and alcohol. Possible side effects of Elevil include, but are not limited to, cardiac effects such as changes in the heart rhythm or palpitations, drowsiness, dizziness, dry mouth or dry eyes, stomach upset, constipation, sweating, and tremor. Because of the possibility of drowsiness or dizziness, begin taking this medication at a time when you will not have to operate equipment, make important decisions, or the like. See your doctor, pharmacist, or prescription insert for more detailed information about these drugs. Depending on your situation, you may need to take painkillers only occasionally, or you may need them more regularly. This is an important discussion to have with your physician. If your pain is mild, the most commonly used drugs are anti-inflammatories, such as ibuprofen. If your pain is very severe, stronger medication, which contains narcotics, may be an option. However, Understand that these drugs may only lessen the pain of IC by 30%, and they can lead to a lesser quality of life and more disability overall. Furthermore, since these types of medications are habit-forming over the long term, you should discuss their use very carefully with your physician. They can also cause severe constipation when taken regularly, so you must take measures to keep your stools loose if you are taking them. Finally, a drug called pregabalin, or Lyrica, and another called gabapentin, or Neurontin, 
are used for certain patients with chronic pain conditions. When medications taken by mouth are not working well enough, treatment options include drugs given into the bladder, called bladder installations, distension of the bladder with water, referral to a dedicated pain clinic, so-called minimally invasive treatments, including Botox or neuromodulation, and surgery. Treatment usually progresses from one to another, rather than skipping ahead to more aggressive steps. Bladder installation involves inserting a thin tube called a catheter into the bladder. The bladder is then filled with a solution called dimethyl sulfoxide, or DMSO. Some doctors will create a so-called cocktail by adding other agents to the solution, depending on their preference. These treatments may be given in the doctor's office, an outpatient clinic, or, with the permission of your doctor, they may sometimes be self-administered at home. The fluid remains in the bladder for about 10 to 15 minutes and then is urinated out. The treatment is repeated every week or two for between 6 and 8 weeks. This is called a treatment cycle. A common side effect of bladder installation is a garlic-like taste and odor on the breath and skin. This lasts for a few days at most. If successful, patients usually notice an improvement within three to four weeks after the first cycle of installations. The treatment can be repeated if symptoms worsen again. Researchers believe that DMSO, which is a solvent, is able to penetrate the bladder wall and decrease inflammation and pain by blocking the formation of so-called free radicals, which are substances that trigger inflammation. The procedure may also reduce certain muscle contractions that cause both pain and the need to urinate urgently, and it may also block histamine release. Another type of drug commonly instilled into the bladder, either alone or as part of the DMSO cocktail, are the so-called heparinoids. These drugs work similarly to oral Elmeron by replacing or reinforcing the gag layer of the mucus lining of the inside of the bladder. Examples of this type of drug include heparin, hyaluronic acid, chondroitin sulfate, and of course, Elmeron. Bladder distension, or hydrodistension, is used for both diagnosis and treatment of IC by some doctors. This procedure is performed under general anesthetic. In other words, the patient is asleep. The lining of the bladder is stretched, or distended, with sterile water at certain pressure until its capacity is reached. The bladder is then reinspected. If the bladder capacity is less than normal, for example, only a cup or so, and small areas of bleeding are seen, that is felt to be diagnostic of IC. This slide illustrates a normal bladder on the left and the bladder of an IC patient on the right. Note that the bladder in the patient with IC is smaller in capacity and has tiny pinpoint areas of bleeding called petechiae. This drawing also shows a few classic Hunter's ulcers, which are less commonly seen, but indicate a more severe condition. It is not entirely clear how bladder distension works to treat IC symptoms. Some research indicates that, when it is successful, bladder distension may interfere with the transition of pain signals to the brain. It may also physically increase the size of the bladder temporarily. It is normal for symptoms to become more severe for a day or two after distension. After that, they generally return to pre-distension levels for a time. Then, two to four weeks later, they improve. Having said all of this, it should be pointed out that for long-term treatment, repeated bladder distensions are a poor choice of therapy. This is because they are only effective in 50% of patients. The results are usually short-lived, and over time they can lead to smaller bladder size and the worsening of one's condition. Surgery should only be considered when all other treatments have failed and IC is totally disabling. Electrocauterization or laser surgery is sometimes considered for Hunter's ulcers on the bladder wall, and this can provide relief. A few surgeons do perform repeated bladder distensions, and occasional patients will get lasting relief from these. However, this is certainly not common practice for most patients and is not appropriate for most as noted above. There is concern with bladder distension that repeated breakdown and rebuilding of the bladder wall may speed the process of scarring and lead to so-called end-stage condition, where treatment becomes even more difficult. Sacral nerve stimulation, or neuromodulation, Botox, and major surgery are discussed in the next few slides. Sacral nerve stimulation, 
also called neuromodulation, bladder pacemaker, or interstim, involves placing a thin wire through a needle into the lower or sacral spine and stimulating the nerve roots there that control bladder activity and pelvic pain. Patients are first tested by having the wire connected to an external stimulator worn in the belt. Then, if the test phase is successful, a permanent pacemaker-type device is implanted into the fatty tissue of the upper buttocks. Success with this treatment has been reported in small studies, but overall, it is less effective for IC than for other bladder conditions. The use of botulinum toxin, or Botox, to treat a variety of conditions has gotten much press over the past several years. Botox has been used in research trials increasingly for a variety of bladder and pelvic conditions. Early research on small numbers of patients suggests that some can get short-lived relief from Botox, either injected directly into the bladder muscle or instilled into the bladder. Most commonly, Botox is injected through a cystoscope into the bladder muscle in a number of spots, usually as an outpatient procedure under local anesthesia or sedation. Presently, Botox is not approved for use in IC, so its use for this condition remains for research trials only. With surgery, the bladder can be made larger, called an augmentation cystoplasty, or it can be removed, called a cystectomy. It has now been shown that simply making the bladder bigger with an augmentation is totally ineffective for IC and should not be considered. If the bladder is removed, the urine drainage must be reconnected to a section of small bowel that either connects to the skin and drains into a bag, connects to the skin via a small tube of bowel that one catheterizes through, or is refashioned into a new bladder. The urine flow can also be diverted away from the bladder without taking out the bladder. Success rates with these surgeries are unpredictable, and complications such as kidney infection and bowel obstruction are possible. While diverting the urine can improve bladder symptoms and improve pain in some, unfortunately, even after total removal of the bladder, so-called phantom pain can persist. These major operations, therefore, are a last resort only for patients with IC. In summary, interstitial cystitis, also called painful bladder syndrome, is a chronic condition with no known cure. The goal of treatment is to find a combination of things that reduces symptoms and improve one's quality of life. Your doctor will develop a treatment plan, which may include medications, lifestyle changes, and procedures to the bladder itself. Through education, you will be better equipped to participate in these management decisions. These resources may help you find further information or support about your condition. This is a sample of modern references which discuss interstitial cystitis that are available at your local medical library. We sincerely hope that this module has furthered your understanding of the treatment of interstitial cystitis. We wish you the best for the future, and thank you once again for viewing this educational program.